Hey everyone, I'm Stephanie, and this is the Italian American Stories Podcast. My mom is back recording with me today. We had so much fun on the Luisa Cicero episode, I invited her back today. How's it going, Mom? It's going good. I'm excited for this episode also. It's going to be sad, but very interesting. Yeah, definitely a little different than Luisa's episode. Right. So, um, but yeah, thanks for recording with me again today. Well, today we're going to talk about the Walsenberg Massacre, where five Italians were unjustly killed. And honestly, I had never heard about this before. I just ran across it when I was researching something for another episode. Did you ever hear about that? No, I have never heard about it. I um, actually didn't even really know that there was a town called Walsenberg in Colorado. (laughs) So, um, but I looked it up and it's in like the southern portion of Colorado And it's just a small town, probably about 50 miles from the New Mexico border. Did you, have you ever been there? I don't remember being there as an adult, but I bet um, in our travels as being a kid probably went through there or close to it. Probably. Because grandpa, he liked to go to New Mexico a lot. Right. So Santa Fe, right? Right. Yeah. So yeah, I'm sure you probably at least traveled through there. I bet we did. Yeah. Because it's on the main interstate. Uh, Walsenburg was formed in 1873 when Fred Walson developed the area to become a coal mining town, and he opened the first mine in 1876. In 1895, where our story takes place, Walsenburg was a prosperous mining town. They actually called it a camp at this time, um, and the camp had over a thousand people living there. So I don't know when it officially became a town, but, you know, I guess they called it a camp because of the mining there. Um... But this story is actually going to start six miles south of Walsenburg at the Rouse Mine. And we'll get back to Walsenburg later. So Rouse Mine was owned by the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company. And it was one of the company's largest coal producers and employed men from all over the world. And a lot of Italians actually worked at the mine. And this mine, it averaged about 70 rail cars of coal a day when it opened in 1888. And this mine was actually one of the largest producers of coal in Colorado at that time. 70 rail cars of coal a day is, seems a lot way back then. Oh, I know. Actually, when I read that fact, I, I kept thinking about, you know, those little cars that you see them pull the oh, yeah, coal yeah, out of the yeah. mine? And I, I, that's what I first thought of when I saw that. And I was like, well, that's a lot. But, <laughs> but then when I think of a railroad car, yeah. 70 of those a day is a lot. That's a lot of tons. Now, the Rouse mine, it had some weird things happening with it. It had a lot of tragedies. So in 1892, a rock fell and killed a miner, John Woolitz. And later that year, an epidemic struck. I think it was in December of that year. And this epidemic, I don't know what it was. I couldn't find anything on it. They just said it was a strange epidemic, but it mainly affected the kids that were at the camp. And in 1893, a cholera epidemic hit the mine. But the tragedy that we're going to talk about today took place in March of 1895. A local man, Abner J. Hickson, who, according to some newspaper articles I read, owned a local bar in the area called Temperance Saloon. That must be a play on words. That's a funny name for... A saloon. I know it's actually it's actually kind of a cool a cool name to name a bar or a saloon. Uh, so mom and I we actually looked it up because we weren't sure what it meant, and it says um, oh, what did it say like restraining restraining from alcohol <laughs> from alcohol <laughs> or controlling oneself so that you don't drink too much or eat, eat too, too much, much yeah. or have too much <laughs> anger. <laughs> so it's kind of a cool a cool play on words, like you said, right. for a bar. Uh, especially considering Prohibition happens in just a couple decades. <laughs> no, that's true. Because this is 1895. <laughs> so on the evening of March 10th, Abner stopped by a local bar to have a drink. And at this bar, there were also a few Italian miners having a drink. Now, one article I read stated that Abner walked by a house, not a bar, and heard the Italians drinking. And it said he entered the house either on his own free will or was invited in, <laughs> which kind of made me laugh because I'm like, what are the other options? Right. <laughs> you either are invited in or you just walk in. So I don't know. Um, but one thing about this situation is that the newspapers, they were all over the place. They repeatedly reported inaccurate information and they couldn't get the names pinned down at all. I think for each Italian man involved in this incident, I found at least eight different spellings, and I'll get into all the Italians here in a little bit, but um, this was, 
this whole incident was known to be just surrounded with misinformation, basically, from the reporters. And in fact, in one article I read, they referred to the journalists as yellow journalists. And I had to look that one up again because... I had never heard of it. (laughs) You hadn't heard of it either. And uh, I think so so much of this, you know, I have to keep reminding myself, this is 1895. Right. It's such a different time how they spoke and referred to things. Um, So yellow journalists, and this is right off of the internet, so quote... Uh, present little or no legitimate, well-researched news while instead using eye-catching headlines for increased sales. So keep that in mind as we go through this um, this episode because the majority of the information out there is just from the newspapers and the reporters, and it never, it never actually went to trial, so there's no court documents um, or anything like that to reference. So, But regardless of where they were, some type of trouble occurred and a fight broke out. I searched everywhere that I could to see if I could figure out what caused this trouble, but I couldn't find anything. But the next morning, March 11th, 1895, Abner Hickson's dead body was found close to the house of John Subel. Subel said that when he woke in the morning, he saw a well-dressed man laying outside of his house. And when he went to check on Abner, he found that he was still breathing. So he summoned a neighbor to go get the doctor, but by the time the doctor arrived, Abner was dead. So the coroner, which was also the doctor at this time, he concluded that Abner was struck over the head multiple times, and that's how he... So the investigators hired a local man, Thomas Brewer, to use his bloodhound Sam to trace down the assailants. And it said in some of the newspaper articles that uh, Thomas, or they referred to him as TJ sometimes, (laughs) I don't know, maybe his middle name is a J... Um, actually just got this bloodhound a couple of weeks but prior to this incident um, down in Texas and he paid $150 for the dog, which in 1895... That's quite a bit of money. <laughs> that's quite a bit of money. So, and I'm sure that this dog, for, to pay that much money, was probably already trained how to track and stuff. I would assume, yeah. That's a lot of money. So... Because how could you trust it otherwise? Ex- exactly, and he'd only had it two weeks. Um... And somehow, Sam the Bloodhound, he tracked two of the Italians to a local saloon, and two other Italians, he tracked them and found them hiding in a home. And the murder weapon, which they determined was a table leg, was found in the cellar of the home. Which, I I don't know, I kind of thought this was, like, strange, because they didn't talk about, like, maybe they started out with Sam at the place where Abner's body was found, because how would the dog, I just kept wondering, like, how would the dog know where to trace to? Like, what did they give him to smell? You know, because usually they give, like, I know, like, if a person's missing, they'll be like, here's the kid's clothing. backpack or clothing. Right. Um, but maybe, I don't know. It, it's, I don't, I don't just don't know how the dog traced it back to um, a saloon and a home. But maybe, I don't, well, I'll get into it here in just a second, but... Uh, they Unless did. they're sent on the dead guy. That's true. From... And they moved the dead guy wherever the fight broke out to this person's house. So maybe they tr- the dog traced the dead guy's body Oh, back. that's true because they carried him over to that house. To that house. So, okay, that makes sense. Now, like I was saying just a couple minutes ago, these newspaper articles all over the place. In a different article, I read that it said Sam traced them to a bar and found the table, table leg in the bar. So who knows? Um. And based off of Sam's tracking, the investigators were able to determine that nine Italian men were involved in the incident, and their names were Antonio Gabetto, Lorenzo Danino, Francesco Rossetto, Pete Giacobino, it was also, like, spelled 15 other ways, this is the one that I saw the most. And then there was Santa Stavo, and I don't, I don't know if this is the right name or not. Um, it's, I've seen it spelled S-A-N-T-I-S-T-A-V-O, and I saw it spelled with an L. I saw it spelled with, like, where it almost looked like Santa Claus. I, I mean, these names are all over. But Santa Stavo's last name is Batoni. Or Volano, I saw that. I saw <laughs> Ventone. I, I think that they just could not understand the Italians at all. So they just wrote it all down. And then there were three other Italians that they determined um, were involved in the incident. But they didn't have any first names. They just had their last names. So one of them was Corporala, 
Nigo. Um, it's N I G I O. I don't even know if that's right. And Nikolai. And the article said that there was nine, but they only gave eight names. So who knows how many there actually were. So the investigators, they interviewed the Italians and Lorenzo Danino, he was pretty quick to confess. And he claimed that Abner actually left on his own will, but then turned around and started firing shots at them. And the investigators said that there was no gun found and the bullet holes that were on the door looked like they were made by a pickaxe. So. Oh, that's strange. I know. So where'd the gun go? Exactly. If there even was a gun. And Abner could have carried it off. Or the Italians could have got rid of it, I guess, if they did do it. Yeah, but you'd think they'd leave it. <laughs> so. Oh, good point. So they have proof that he had a gun. Exactly. Or, yeah, no, that's a really good point. Because if they're claiming that Abner turned and shot at them, then that's self-defense. Right. So even if they hid the gun, they could say, well, we know where the gun is. It's over here. So or Abner's friend took the gun. That's true. The people who um, found him were probably his friends. Oh, that's a good point. I didn't even think about that. And then for the bullet holes on the door to look like they were made by a pickaxe. Like. Yeah, that's. <laughs> Kind of strange. I mean, Lorenzo, according to what I read in the newspaper reports, he did confess to it right away. Um, keep in mind, there's always that language barrier, you know, right. as well. And Not knowing, say, he could have been trying to explain, well, yes, we got in a fight, but, and they just take what words they can it, decipher out of it. Exactly. Or just took that as a confession of murder. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. So just a quick breakdown of the Italians that were named in this incident. Uh, Lorenzo Danino, he was 24 years old and he was actually still an Italian citizen. Then Antonio Gabetta, he was also 24 years old and he had a wife and three children who were still in Italy. And he was still an Italian citizen, but uh, he was in the process of filing his paperwork to gain citizenship. Pete Giacobino, he was 34 years old and filing his paperwork to gain citizenship as well. And Francisco Rossetta, he was 24 years old and according to a newspaper article, had, quote, declared his intention of citizenship. Stanislavo Batoni was 30 years old and he had a wife and three children in Italy and he had also declared his intention of citizenship. According to the investigators, Antonio Gabetto, he held down Abner Hickson while Lorenzo Danino, he struck him over the head three times with a table leg. And then they carried Abner to the home of Subel, where they left him to die. And like I said, Lorenzo was the one who confessed. So I'm assuming this is coming from Lorenzo, but through the investigator's lens. And talk of lynching the Italian men it developed pretty quick in the area. But the authorities felt that, they, that there really shouldn't be any violence because they were arresting people so quick. And the authorities also didn't fear backlash from the Italian community because they didn't really have a lot of family in the area or the numbers to retaliate. But anyways, Lorenzo was immediately taken to the town of Walsenburg and put in jail. And the other Italians, they were loaded into a wagon and taken to Walsenburg later on in the afternoon. The wagon was driven by a young man, Joseph Walsby, who was 23 years old. And he was accompanied by Deputy Sheriff Danford and City Marshal Harriman followed behind them on horseback. And the paper said that he carried a Winchester. So that's kind of a Old West image right there. Yeah. Um, and the sheriff, Sheriff O'Malley, he was actually not able to attend the transfer because he was dealing with another prisoner in Walsenburg. So as the transfer party was approaching Bear Creek Bridge, which is only about a mile from Walsenburg, Six or seven masked horsemen approached the wagon, uh, and they had the marshal, who was the guy on the horse, dismount from his horse and stand aside. And they ordered Wellesby to stop the wagon and had the deputy sheriff put his hands in the air. And then the masked men, they had the Italian prisoners get out of the wagon. And at this point, they started firing upon the Italians. So the horses, they took off when the gunfire started. And Wellesby, who was the driver, he wasn't able to control the horses. So he ended up jumping off the wagon and the deputy sheriff jumped off as well. When Wellesby jumped off, he tried to run across the road and unfortunately he was shot. Um, I, I don't think that, that he was their intended target. It was just an unfortunate accident. 
the deputy who was with him, he comforted Wellesby, but Wellesby only lived for a few minutes. And the four Italians that were in the wagon were Antonio Gabetto, Pete Giacobino. That's the way I would say it. Me too. It just, it looks so bizarre. Uh, Stanislavo Batoni and Francesco Rossetto. They got out of the wagon, and when the gunshot started, they all started running. And some were actually able to escape into the country, or to the woods, like a forest area. Uh, But Francisco Rossetto, he was shot in the chest and started to walk to town. And the sheriff, Sheriff O'Malley, who was on his way, he actually picked him up and took him to the jail. So, I don't know, I guess, like, you'd think they would take him to the hospital. I mean, (laughs) he was shot. Um, But I did see in one article, one newspaper article, it said that it was just a slight wound to his left breast. So, maybe it wasn't a gunshot. Maybe, you know, he scraped himself when he was running or something. Uh, Stanislavo, he was actually found the next day, and he was was found... uh, deceased and he was riddled with bullets according to the newspaper article and it's weird because he made it to the town of Walsenburg and they found him next to a slaughterhouse and Antonio and Pete they they were they were able to just take off um and I'll talk about them a little bit later but uh so obviously these men on the horse they were probably friends family um worked with Abner and they were seeking revenge for his death because I mean, all of this happened in less than 24 hours. So you're talking Abner getting killed, them finding Abner's body, and then them attacking this wagon. So these men, they were not waiting for any facts to come out or witnesses to be interviewed. They were just seeking revenge based off of rumors, pretty much. Sounds like that. Yep, exactly. Just that vigilante justice, I guess you could say. Right. Yeah, without knowing any facts yet. Um, and, you know, the Italians in the area, of course, they were the minority, and many were not even American citizens yet, so they weren't looked at as equal in the eyes of many. And probably these horse, these men on the horse, they probably thought that they could pretty much get away with it, because they weren't American citizens, you know? Right. But, sadly, the carnage didn't stop there. Uh, that evening, at the Walsenberg Jail, A group of armed men showed up and were banging on the door to be let in. And the two guards who were at the jail were Henry Farr and William Smith. And they were playing a card game. I saw one that it was high five and one where it said it was seven up. Not that it really matters. but So when the two guards asked who was there, the armed men said it was Walt. And of course the guards thought that this was Sheriff Walter O'Malley. So they opened the door and the men came right in. And one reporter retold the situation by claiming when the two guards opened the door, instead of seeing Sheriff O'Malley, they, quote, looked down the barrels of two revolvers. And so here, I think, is a prime example of yellow journalism. Oh, for you them. Know. Yeah, making it sound like... Yeah. So, like, they completely dramatized the situation. And I'm sure that the, you know, the two men did have their guns, but looking down the barrels of the revolvers and... You know, just trying to get that headline to get the readers to read it, basically. Yeah, I I bet you're right. Yeah, it just, it feels like a movie scene to me, you know, or a Western book. (laughs) Um, So the the masked men, they rush into the jail and they force the guards to drop their guns and stand aside. And they went to the cell that was holding Lorenzo and Francisco. So just a warning, this next part, it's it's really sad and a little graphic. Um... Lorenzo and Francisco, they begged the men for mercy in broken English, but the armed men, they shot Lorenzo and Francisco multiple times. Lorenzo, he was killed instantly, but Francisco, he was shot in the neck and in the chest, and he was actually, he was still alive and he lived for a little while. So they didn't show mercy to the Italians, but they did, however, show mercy to a third man who was in the same cell with the Italians, and this guy was Frank Olk. And they just had him stand in the corner while they shot Lorenzo and Francisco. So after the shooting, the armed men, they immediately escaped into the darkness. And apparently the two guards, Farr and Smith, then picked up their weapons and started firing at the armed men. But nothing came of that. They didn't, they didn't catch him or shoot him. A doctor was called to the jail cell to attend to Francisco, but Francisco died while the doctor was there. And at this time, a large crowd of Walsenberg citizens had heard the gunshots and gathered at the jail to see what was happening. So the next day, a coroner's jury was convened to investigate the killing of Wellesby, Lorenzo, and Francisco. 
And authorities, they believed that the trouble was over. However, they were starting to get a little worried about a group of Italians that were gathering at Brunelli's saloon. But nothing ever came of this. They, the Italians, they didn't retaliate and no violence came out of it. However, the Italian consul, Joseph Cuneo, he came to Walsenburg to ensure the safety of the Italians in Walsenburg. And he actually wrote a letter to the governor, which I'm, not, I'm going to read the letter really quick. It's, it's a short letter, but it's, it's interesting. To His Excellency A.W. McIntyre, Governor of Colorado. Sir, I have from reliable authority that at or near the town of Walsenburg, Colorado, this morning about two o'clock, two Italians were taken from the jail by a mob and lynched, and also that there are seven or more men, supposed to be Italians, still in the custody of the authorities of Herfano County, who are threatened to be treated in a like manner. Therefore, I, Joseph Caneo, acting Italian consul for this district, call upon you as a governor of this state to take such steps as may be necessary to ensure protection for the life and property of the Italians in the custody of the authorities in the said Herfano County. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, J. Cuneo, acting Italian consul. Okay, this is the letter that the Italian consul in Colorado wrote to the governor. And obviously, a lot of this information doesn't match what you and I have already talked about. Like, Right, that's what I was just thinking. All the, I don't know. It says that it took, the mob took the two men out of the jail and lynched them, which generally lynching means that it's a hanging. But that's not always necessarily the case, but usually. Um, but according to everything else that I've read, they were just shot and killed in the jail cell. So again, even the information that the Italian consul is getting in Denver, Colorado, is completely different than what's being reported. Yeah, this is all over this this yeah. story. I know, it's, it's bizarre. It's just, I don't know if it's because it was a smaller town. It, it's hard to say. So the governor, he actually replied to the Italian, to, to Cuneo, uh, and I'm going to read his reply. Sir, replying to your communication of March 13th, just received, I have the honor to say that I have telegraphed to the sheriff of, Walsen, of Walsenburg for information concerning the alleged lynchings and directing him to protect his prisoners and to maintain order within his jurisdiction and will take such further steps as are necessary and can be taken within the authority conferred upon me by law to ensure protection to the life and property of the Italians in custody in said Herfano County, the same as if they were American citizens. I have further the honor to say that it is not yet known to me that the Italians in question are not American citizens. Respectfully, your obedient servant, Albert W. McIntyre, Governor of Colorado. I, I thought that that was kind of a cool response from the governor you know he's basically saying even if they're not american citizens we'll they still... should be protected yeah they should be protected and uh even the ones that were murdered if they're not american citizens will still try to find justice so i thought that was kind of um kind of a cool correspondence between the two right i got this out of uh, a uh, newspaper at colorado the colorado daily and that's out of pueblo colorado which is a little bit larger of an of a town than um Walsenburg. so i think that they probably just interpreted the or got the telegraphs and put those in the newspapers and governor mcintyre he actually ended off ended up offering a thousand dollar reward for the arrest and conviction of the parties involved in murdering the italians and wellsby too because I, I keep referring to the italians but joseph wellsby was killed as well and a thousand dollars in today's money is about thirty-seven thousand. so wow pretty good so there were apparently rumors all over town and reporters were starting to come into the Waldenburg area and the townspeople, they were starting to arm themselves because, you know, they were basically feared that there would be retaliation continuing from Abner's friends or a retaliation on the Italian side. Um, and the authorities felt like the situation was actually starting to spiral out of control. And when I say the situation, mainly the situation with the news reporters, because I think they started to feel like the news reporters were creating drama within the town, uh, starting to spread rumors, and they actually had the wires cut at the local telegraph office. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that, I thought that was crazy right. too. Yeah, so they cut these so that no more false information would be sent out, and I think in the Denver Post it said that they, they didn't want uh, information sent to the north or the south because they couldn't control it anymore. Well, probably a good choice. Exactly, yeah. 
<laughs> I'm sure that the electrician who had to come back in and rewire that was not happy, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, you couldn't just keep him away from the telegraph machine. You had to <laughs> cut the wires. <laughs> um, so the coroner investigation, it actually hit a snag because they couldn't figure out a motive. Apparently, Abner was a well-liked man, and he was mild-mannered, and kind of got along with everybody. So really the only thing that they had to go on was Lorenzo's testimony, or I guess more of a confession. And one newspaper article even admitted that it is, quote, unlikely that the men who did the killing will ever be definitely known except among themselves. So I think at this point, everybody started realizing that this was really going to go nowhere. Um, They weren't going to probably get a whole lot of information from the Italians and nobody in town was probably going to turn these people in. So. Right. It was kind of done. Um, everyone apparently did think that the men were responsible for killing the Italians, either worked at the mine or were personal friends of Abner's, which obviously, I mean, they seeked revenge for his death. Immediately. Immediately. Exactly. Now, if you remember, there were actually four Italians that were in the wagon and two of them were already found. So Francisco was picked up uh, by the sheriff, and they found Stanislavo dead. Pete and Antonio Gabetto were the other two in the wagon, and they have not been found yet at this point. However, four days after the massacre, Pete Giacobino, he was actually found alive. Uh, he was taken to the hospital for frostbite, and it was said that he would most likely have to have his foot amputated. But Pete, he was actually able to recount his story to the authorities from his hospital bed, And he told them that he spent four days in the woods and said that when the men ordered them out of the wagon and started shooting at them, he ran as fast as he could for the trees. And he said when he was running, he could actually hear the bullets whizzing by his head. Um, And so he kept running and he eventually found a creek and he ran alongside the creek bed. But he eventually decided that his best bet would be to climb a tree. And so he found a really tall pine tree and climbed it and stayed up there for quite a while. (laughs) Poor guy. Um, He did eventually climb down uh, when he was sure that the men had left and the the shooting had stopped. And he said he took off into the woods but wasn't sure what direction he went. Now, keep in mind, this is March in Colorado. And that can still be really cold and snowy. We can get snow clear into May, especially up in the mountains. So he was probably miserable at night, especially. And at one point, he had to crawl on his hands and knees because his feet were hurting so bad because he had frostbite. I'm sure. Can't even imagine. Um, Because the ground is frozen still at that point. So you're not getting any warmth. Uh, He eventually found the home of a rancher who told him he was 17 miles away from the Rouse mine. So he went a long ways because they were only a mile away when the shooting occurred. So, to Walsenburg. To Walsenburg. So he went quite a ways. Um, and the rancher, he actually gave him a donkey to ride in t- into town. Now, I'm not sure if he took Pete on the donkey or if he let him have the donkey. But either way, he rode a donkey into town. And once he got to town, he went to the authorities and they took him to the hospital. Now, let's talk about Antonio Gabetto. He, this is one of the craziest parts of this whole story, was never found. Oh, wow, really? Yep, they never found him. So, I mean, I hope that he didn't perish out in the woods. Maybe he survived and made it to a different town and went by a different name. But yeah, they never found him. They never found his body and they never found him alive. Well... Hopefully he did make it out. I looked at the census to see if I could find him, and I never, I couldn't find anything on him. So if he did make it out, my guess is he probably used a different name and went on with his life. Yeah. So especially if he was innocent, you know, if if he was innocent, I and didn't kill Abner. I hope that he got out and lived a happy life. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I'm gonna say he did. Me too. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go with that. So now keep in mind, four years earlier, the largest single mass lynching happened in New Orleans where 11 Italians were killed by a mob of people who thought that the Italians were responsible for killing the police chief. This was still a fresh memory in America, especially for Italian Americans. So the Italian officials in Denver and Washington, they were really quick to call attention to the situation in Walsenburg, and they demanded that federal, that the federal government take action. Um, And a San Francisco Italian newspaper reporter, 
He expressed his disgust with the federal government for not taking steps after the New Orleans lynching to protect Italians or enact new laws. Because like I said, this is only four years after that. And we're talking through four Italians, three, three or four Italians uh, that were massacred. And the reporter said, quote, nobody has any delusion about the outcome, even in the remote possible case that the offenders may be found and be put to trial, no jury in Colorado will be impartial enough to produce a guilty verdict against them. So there's a lot of bitter feelings and not, not a lot of trust in the government to take the right steps. Yeah, that's the way it sounds. Yeah, because I mean, you're talking from New Orleans to Colorado to San Francisco. Um, however, interestingly though, the Italian colony in Denver, they felt a little different. They actually felt that the governor of Colorado, so Governor McIntyre, really went to bat for them. In one article, the governor actually talked about how he felt that the sheriff and the sheriff deputies were probably corrupt and may have been involved in the murders. And when the governor issued the $1,000 reward, it was the highest reward allowed or given in Colorado at that time. And the Italian colony in Denver, they were quoted saying that they felt like the governor really felt their pain and was not just doing his job. In fact, the Italians decided to acknowledge the governor with an award. An Italian representative was quoted saying, The Italian colony of Denver has resolved to present to the governor of this state an artistic parchment to show its appreciation for his interest and impartiality in the ill-fated Waldenberg affair. And so they obviously felt like they had support. They had some justice. Exactly, some justice and somebody going to bat for them, basically. Right. Um, so Cuneo, the Italian consul, he would actually, like, during this whole incident, he would stay up all night in his office waiting for communication, ensuring that the Italians in Walsenburg area would be protected. And he told the Denver Rocky Mountain News that he, quote, was expecting telegrams every minute. Uh, he basically just wanted up to date, uh, or I'm sorry, he basically wanted up to the minute developments, which is kind of crazy to think about considering this is 1895. Yeah, that's good on his part. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And how quick that he could get the the telegraphs until they cut the wires, of course. But <laughs> um, it's just crazy to think that he could get fairly up to date developments in 1895. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, and Caneo, eventually, he did make it down to the Walsenberg area to hold his own investigation. And he even hired a local photographer, Ida May Bunker, to, photographer, to photograph the Italian men before they were buried. And I have to admit, I did search for these photos. I know that's a little morbid, but I knew I probably wasn't going to find them, but I had to try. <laughs> I mean... Yeah, well... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you gotta you gotta look for those, right? And of course, I couldn't find them anywhere. It's your episode. So. Exactly. <laughs> yep, I gotta try and find it. Um, but unfortunately, Caneo's investigation did not turn up any evidence. But it did lead to Congress taking action and paying reparations to the families of the slain Italian men. And Congress agreed to pay ten thousand dollars. I did see somewhere where it was fifteen thousand dollars, so somewhere in there, uh, to be paid and split among the families. And ten thousand dollars today is about three hundred and sixty-five thousand. So wow, yeah, that's a lot. One interesting thing, though, that did come out of Caneo's investigation was Pete Giacobino. He was the Italian that had frostbite. He told Caneo that he only saw one man come up to the wagon, uh, and he believed that it was Sheriff Deputy John Fleming. And he said that John Fleming was the only shooter at the prisoner wagon. So that's oh, kind of interesting. That's... Huh, that's probably true. Mm hmm And kind of scary. Um, and brave of him to testify of that, to testify to that. Right. Because there can be some retaliation there. But, again, nothing ever came of it. And the Italian men who were killed, they were actually buried at St. Mary's Cemetery in the Italian section. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, in the St. Mary's Cemetery is separated by north and south, and the Italian section is in the southern part. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I did put in a request with findagrave.com for the photos of their headstones. If I get them, I'll post them on the Instagram page. And all of the Italians in the Walsenberg area attended the funerals of the men. So the Rouse mine, it started to go downhill in 1897 when it was flooded. And I guess around 500 feet of water entered the mine. 
and they could never really get the pumps or the mine operating again successfully. So the mine, so the mine officially closed in 1899. Another interesting part of this story is if you remember, there was a third man in the jail cell with Lorenzo and Francisco, and he that was Frank Olk. And he actually ended up telling his story of the events five years later to a Denver Post reporter. He was actually incarcerated in the Colorado State Prison at this time. And he was serving time for the criminal assault that he committed in Walsenburg. So that's why he was in the prison cell. And the reporter described Olk as, quote, he has a story to tell. If he be guilty, he has been forced to bear not only the burden of his own crime, but the horrible secret of other men's blood guiltless guiltiness. If innocent, he is the victim of official menace and legalized injustice, quite up to the standards of the 15th century. So basically what Oak is doing here is he's trying to use the incident in Walsenburg to, uh, to his benefit so that he can appeal his case and get out of prison. And so he's, you know, like, feel sorry for me, I witnessed this massacre. And he claimed that he was threatened with death if he told who committed the murders. But he also said that he couldn't identify them with it being dark and them wearing a mask. And another interesting thing that Olk says is he claims that the the murderers, uh, they actually lit the bed in the cell on fire and he had to step out of the cell to avoid the flames, which I didn't hear about that anywhere else, but that's what Olk's saying happened. So never heard about that anywhere else. And this is five years later when Olk is giving this interview. You would think that that would have been in one of those articles. That was probably a very small... Oh. Gel. Right, who put the fire out. Exactly. And the gel, was, you're exactly right, it was so small, it only had one cell. And that was it. So, I, I don't know where this guy's coming up with that. but So, that's the Wassenberg Massacre, which never had any real justice. Yeah, that was a sad episode. Mm -hmm. It is. Because, you know, even if they were guilty... And they did kill Abner. That's not the way we do it. You know, you don't, we don't have vigilante justice. And, right. You know, and if they were innocent, words, I don't even have any words for that. How sad that is. So, um, kind of interesting. I've never, never heard of it. No, nor have I. Mm -mm. We're both born and raised in Colorado. Um, while I was researching this, I, I did actually run across a cool article about a saloon owner in Walsenburg. And he was Charles Victor Mazzoni. And he owned a saloon and opera house in Walsenburg. And I think he owned like the whole building. And so he rented out a portion of it to a Robert Ford. And Robert Ford was actually the man who killed Jesse James. Wow. I know, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> now, he didn't kill him in Walsenburg. He killed him in St. Louis, Missouri. But it's still kind of weird and maybe a possible person I can explore for another episode, this Mazzoni guy. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well thank you for recording with me. Oh, thank you for having me. Oh, that was very interesting. Yeah. And uh I'm sure you'll be back for plenty more. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or I'm sure you'll be back for more. Um well I hope you enjoyed listening to the story of the Waldenberg Massacre and I hope you come back to listen to more stories about Italian Americans. See you next time.